33-year-old male from a city of Nadra, with no past medical history presenting with acute blood loss and hypovolemic shock. History obtained from eyewitnesses on the scene. Patient was reportedly beaten several times, flocked on his back 39 times with a metal whip, and maintained without any food or water intake for approximately 12 hours. Prior to arrival, a crown of thorns was placed on his head with subsequent scalp hemorrhage. On examination, patient is hypotensive with a thready pulse. Patient is in severe distress and agony. Pain score, 10 out of 10. He is pale, weak, and dehydrated. Mouth and tongue are extremely dry. Cardiopulmonary examination, notable for rapid breathing with deep labored inspirations. Skin examination, notable for multiple deep skin lacerations with active bleeding along the face, torso, and back. Fully penetrating puncture wounds are noted in patients' bilateral wrists and feet. Assessment 33-year-old male admitted with mixed cardiogenic and hemorrhagic shock in the setting of acute blood loss, anemia due to torture complicated with severe dehydration and extreme pain. Jesus of Nazareth is dying. No medical treatment available at this time. Davias Josephus 37 CE wrote about some recording of crucifixion. They were first whipped, then tormented with all sorts of tortures before they died and were crucified before the wall of the city. The soldiers, out of wrath and hatred, they bored the Jews, nailed those they caught to the crosses in different postures by way of jest. Lucius Annius Seneca, 4 BCE. I see crosses there, not just one kind, but made in many different ways. Some have their victims with their head down to the ground. Some impale their private parts. Others stretch out their arms. What is the date of crucifixion? Professor Colin Humphreys, professor of materials in Cambridge University, and his associate astrophysicist arrived at the date of crucifixion, Friday, the 3rd of April the year 33. He arrived at this in four stages. Pontius Pilate was the procurator of Judea when Jesus died. His post was from 26 till 36 AD. All four Gospels report that Jesus died a few hours before the nightfall of Friday, before the Jewish feast of Passover. And the book of Acts states that there was a lunar eclipse the moon turned into red. Passover was always held on the 14th day of the month called Nisan. All that remains is to show when is the lunar eclipse that happened in that year. The only date that met all these four criteria, according to Professor Humphreys, is Friday the 3rd of April, the year 33. On Thursday, April 6, Nisan 13, year 33, the Last Supper would have been observed and Jesus would have been crucified the next day. It started like any other day of April in Palestine, but progressed to become a very extraordinary day. Thalos, an unchristian historian, wrote about a lunar eclipse that happened during that time. According to Humphreys and Waddington, the only eclipse that occurred between the years 26 and 36 was the one occurring at Passover on April 3rd, 33 AD. So capital punishment, nowadays we think of it as something that's more humane. Uh, usually we see capital punishment as uh, an electric chair or uh, lethal injection. However, uh, at the time of Christ, capital punishment that was chosen for him was death by crucifixion. Uh, and this is so much more cruel than any kind of capital punishment that we would have nowadays. Uh, and that's not because there, are, there were no other options that they had, but it was because it was meant to be so cruel. It was meant to be uh, to make an example of those people who were criminals and uh, to deter others from following the same offense. Crucifixion of our Lord is a puzzle. Our Lord Jesus Christ was 33 years of age. 
he is not known to have been complaining of any sickness. As a matter of fact, he traveled miles and miles to meet many of his acquaintances, including the Samaritan woman. Even Pilate, as it is written in the Gospels, marveled that he died too soon on the cross. Hence, his death and his sufferings remain to be a puzzle. The question is, why is someone who is so young as Christ was, uh, we guesstimate that his age was uh, around 33 years old when he died. A young, healthy person uh, should be able to tolerate uh, the crucifixion for much longer and would not die so quickly. The, th the events that led up to the time of the crucifixion will give us insight as to why this death happened so quickly. Remember, our Lord was in otherwise good health. He had no known medical conditions. Uh, he had no family history. Uh, his mother, uh, St. Mary, was alive and well and able to travel with him to the cross. Uh, she did not, did not appear to have any medical illnesses, at least from what the scriptures have told us. Our Lord had no toxic habits. He was clearly able to travel back and forth uh, from Galilee to Judea and back and forth uh, with no documented uh, limitations. However, from Thursday 9 p.m. until 9 a.m. on Friday, he was subjected to physical torture, sleep deprivation, water deprivation, humiliation, and many other types of tortures. How did Thursday night into Friday morning contribute to uh, the suffering and the agony and the eventual dying of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, on Thursday night to Friday morning, uh, we know that our Lord was already experiencing the emotional stress, the dehydration, and then he started going from trial to trial, um, walking several miles. And in this journey, uh, he did not have any food, he did not have any water, he did not sleep clearly on Thursday night. Uh, there was the public mockery, he was physically beaten, blindfolded, he was spit upon, he was struck on the face, as you can see in this map, Jesus and his disciples traveled about 2.5 kilometers from the upper room towards Gethsemane. Gethsemane is situated outside Jerusalem. And because it was illegal for them to go through Jerusalem at night, they had to go the longer route. Our Lord spent a few hours in Gethsemane, praying, struggling, spending the night almost alone when his disciples slept, until the soldiers of the temple, led by Judas, came to arrest Jesus. They took him through inside the town, from Gethsemane all the way to Caiaphas' house, a distance of about 1.2 kilometers. Jesus Christ spent a few hours, almost towards the early morning, between Caiaphas' house, and also in the same place was Annas, who is the ex-high priest. By early morning on Friday, he was transferred by the soldiers of the temple from Caiaphas' house to Pilate's palace, a distance of less than 0.2 of a kilometer. He was tried there for his third trial. During that trial, Pilate decided to take the opinion of his old enemy, Herod. Jesus traveled from Pilate's house to Herod, a distance also of about 0.2 kilometer. Herod was there because of the Passover. He was very pleased to see Jesus, but he mocked him and he hurt him and flogged him. But when he found no sin in him, he sent him back another 0.2 kilometer to Pilate's house. Now it's about very early in the morning of Friday, maybe 9 a.m. Pilate decided to make sort of a theatrical issue between Barabbas and Jesus. And when the people requested that to free Barabbas, he sent Jesus to be crucified. Jesus then carried his cross and went outside the city because Golgotha has to be outside Jerusalem, a distance of about 0.4 kilometer. 
So all the distances collectively together between the night of Thursday until the morning of Friday, about five to six kilometers. Gethsemane. Jesus Christ spent from probably 6 p.m. the eve of Friday or Thursday night until around 9 p.m. when he was arrested. Then he was taken from 9 p.m. to Caiaphas' house. Let us just focus on Gethsemane for a few minutes. We read in Luke 22, in his anguish he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. One of the first things that we know is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was there praying a stone's throw away from the disciples. And as he was praying, the Gospel specifically mentions how he was sweating, sweating so profusely that the sweat was coming down as if it was drops of blood. This is uh, a time where uh, you're losing so much volume in this sweat and there is a condition uh, in medicine called hematidrosis. Hematidrosis is the condition where uh, someone would sweat out blood um, and it's not just like it's not uh, as if you're sweating out uh, and pouring out blood but it is blood gets into the sweat glands uh, and people uh, have noted that this happens, especially at a time of extreme stress or a time of stress combined with fear. And there is actually a medical condition referred to as hematohydrosis or hemidrosis, in which the capillary blood vessels um, that feed the sweat glands on the skin, they can rupture. And when uh, these uh, blood vessels rupture, that can cause uh, bleeding. This is a rare but very well-documented phenomenon in many medical journals, usually accompanied by severe stress or severe anxiety or agony. Basically, the blood vessels open up and instead of sweat coming, the capillaries under the skin breaks and blood is mixed with sweat. One of the cases from China actually for a young female, she will have this bloody fluid coming out of her face and her hand. Our scientists and doctors actually analyze these cells and it comes out like red blood cells and white blood cells, which is the component of blood. So this is actually blood. So like here. So under the microscope, we needed to know to see if it's this blood coming out of the duct of the sweat glands. Here we have on the black arrow, uh, it has a blood vessel and these RBCs is going out the blood vessel into the connective tissue around it, but not in the duct. The duct is empty. So the sweat duct itself is empty, but the blood is all around the tissue. This is another case from Korea and this patient is a young male and it has this in the face and his hand also but the, the ducts and the sweat glands itself it's empty it doesn't have any RBCs it doesn't have any red blood cells so it was weird why it's happening another one has the same thing but I want to show to you here the surrounding of the sweat gland it's a little bit pinkish which means the, the, con the congestion of the capillary, the capillary is, is a little bit congested, but still there is no RBCs inside the ducts. Let's move to the thorny crown. The Cephas Spina Christi, also known as Christ Thorn, usually grows in tropical Africa and Western Asia. This plant is also named as Shizaf, in Hebrew. In rabbinical literature, this plant is called Rimen, and in the Talmud, it's called Canary, because it was widely spread around Lake Kinneret or the Sea of Galilee, as is written in the Talmud. It has crooked branches, and usually the spines come into threes, and it's very, very painful and can pierce the skin. And, uh, and then on Friday morning, they placed a crown of thorns on his head. 
and the purpose of this was to mock uh, our Lord uh, as king, uh, but also to inflict pain. If you think about the crown of thorns, if you ever see a thorn bush and you get uh, pricked by a thorn, it causes this sudden pain, you're, you put your finger away, and also a little blood. But imagine a crown filled with the thorns and uh, digging deep into the head of our Lord Jesus Christ, causing his skin to break and for significant bleeding to occur. Many things can occur with the crown of thorns, the, the first uh, being the pain that is inflicted that can cause for his physical weakness. The second is the bleeding as the skin breaks um, and this is contributing to the, uh, the bloodshed that our Lord Jesus Christ uh, endured for us, that eventually leading to him dying on the cross. And the third thing is, uh, as the skin is opened, there's now uh, an opening for infection to develop uh, through the skin and the soft tissue that can also lead to our Lord Jesus Christ um, dying on the cross. So the facial nerve is the nerve that covers all your face and whenever you have a toothache, something like this, or headache even, it comes through this nerve. And it also uh, innervates all the muscles in your face. So whenever you have any expression or micro expression even, it, uh, it is innervated by this um, nerves. Any hurting uh, object in this place will be will elicit a fiery pain and will be so difficult to uh, endure so the other thing is any micro expression even talking will have the same pain because anything like the spikes anchoring in the muscles so anytime you move these muscles the pain will be uh, so sharp the crown more than likely was a cap not just a crown, almost like a full placed crown over the scalp and it's pushed into the scalp because they placed it on Jesus' head in Caiaphas' house but later on was taken out and then replaced again at the time of crucifixion. The human body, one of the areas of the skin that has so much vasculature, meaning that there's so many blood vessels that bleeds very easily upon any cut, is the scalp. And we find that the scalp bleeds so much that even when, when they're doing neurosurgery, you find that they use special clips to put on the scalp as they open it and, uh, and uh, get into the head to be able to do any kind of surgery. Uh, but in the case of our Lord, these thorns are digging into the skin of the head, into the scalp, and the amount of blood that will come to be lost because of these uh, thorns that are piercing through the skin of the, the head is uh, going to be a lot because it's a very heavily uh, vascular, has a lot of blood vessels, and so it will easily lose a lot of blood through any uh, cuts in the head. The scourging. This was a legal phenomenon always used before crucifixion. It's meant to break the prisoner before they actually put him on the cross. Usually, the flagellum has three branches like this, and each one has pieces of bones, or sometimes pieces of steel, or pieces of broken glass. Usually the prisoner is tied to a post. One or of the two men, they call them lictors, will start whipping him and they alternate with each other. Usually 39 times, times three, because those are three branches, which means our Lord Jesus Christ was flogged 117 times. And so he is taken to be flogged and at the time when he's flogged, uh, we see that he's getting, he's getting 39 lashes. It's 40 minus 1. So he's getting these 39 lashes on his back. These whips are equipped with a very strong end. And as they hit the back, it is not just causing an open wound on the back, but it's also removing parts of the skin. So not just are you losing blood on every time, 
that it's uh, hitting the back, but it's also the skin is being torn off. And when the skin is torn off, we kind of see this in a condition uh, that uh, people might face when they have a burn. You see, the skin is a natural protection, a natural barrier of moisture uh, between uh, the environment and our bodies. So moisture cannot get in through the skin and moisture cannot get out through the skin unless there's an opening. And when there's an opening, when the skin is removed, when the skin is not intact, it starts to create uh, a loss of this barrier. And when you don't have that barrier, uh, fluids in your body can easily escape. And we see this a lot in, in burn victims. And so it's a di difficult condition to treat. And at this point, not only is, is our Lord Jesus Christ, as He's suffering through the flogging, uh, is He uh, losing blood, but He's also losing volume through the fact that the skin is not intact any longer. The, the scourging definitely contributed to uh, the suffering, the bloodshed, the, and the death of our Lord. Jesus Christ. In the Roman times when uh, uh, a criminal would be whipped or flogged, uh, they would be flogged with a whip 39 times. And if you think about the whip, the whip was made with a wooden handle and there's a leather strap and at the end of the leather strap are these uh, metal balls, whether they're iron or lead. And there's also uh, um, these sharp animal uh, bones. And you have to consider that when the uh, criminal or the person that's being whipped is enduring this, they're being attached to a, what's called a flogging post. And this flogging post, uh, their hands are stretched outright like this, and um, they're tied to the post, and then the scourging happens to the back, in the buttocks, and in the legs. And a couple of things can happen when uh, this person, when our Lord Jesus Christ um, is being whipped. The first thing is that the, uh, the leather can cause uh, an abrasion on the skin. And then of course the metal balls can cause a contusion that can go through the skin, through the soft tissue, uh, and even to the muscle. And the metal balls can lead to significant internal bleeding. And then the sharp animal bones or the sharp um, sheep bones, a lot of times these were, would cause uh, stripe-like lacerations through the skin. And the purpose of this is to cause more bleeding, more pain, and, if, and now another uh, opportunity for infection uh, to develop. Of course, these lictors or soldiers do not try to be hitting the back only. Some of these things may come on the back of the head, the thigh, or even go around into the area of the stomach and the chest. These pieces of bones or broken glass or bolts of iron can cause deep tears of the tissues and the muscles. It can also cause severe bleeding and hemorrhage. One of the things that's important to note about the flogging or the, or the scourging is that um, a lot of times uh, when an individual is being whipped uh, or flogged or scourged, that they are tied to the flogging post with their arms outstretched like this. And the reason for that is th so that if the individual uh, becomes unconscious or passes out or even dies, that um, uh, from the pain and the blood loss that occurs, they can continue scourging and whipping the victim uh, to continue the pain uh, from this very painful and traumatic scourging uh, that was done. From a biblical account, Isaiah 52 reads, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. In Isaiah 50, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Medically, just by flogging alone, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, his medical condition is critical. At this point in the Lord's journey, you wonder how weak had he become already. And the weakness at this point in the Lord's journey before he even carried the cross um, 
was one from the amount of blood that he's lost already from the, the blood loss in the Garden of Gethsemane and now the blood loss from the crown of thorns and the blood loss from the scourging. Was it a liter or two liters? It's, uh, un it's hard to know, but a significant amount of blood loss. Uh, in addition to that, severely dehydrated. No food or water for, uh, for more than uh, 12 to 20 hours at this point. Um, in addition to that, no sleep the night before. For sure his body was very weakened. Crucifixion. Crucifixion began among the Persians and perfected by the Romans, used as a form of torture and capital punishment, designed to produce a slow death with maximal pain and suffering. It was the most disgraceful and cruelest method of being punished. The cross usually has an upright post that is placed in the ground. Horizontal crossbar called the patubulum. The cross usually weighs between 75 and 125 pounds. Its height, five to six feet long. Usually the condemned man carries his patubulum from the place of flogging to the place of crucifixion. There is a small piece of wood called the saddle where the condemned man rests his feet during the time of crucifixion. On the top of the cross, there is a place where the name of the condemned man is written, called the Titulus. And in Jesus' time, it was written in many languages. They all shout, crucify him, crucify him. And so he gives the order for him to be crucified. And at this point, what happens? He is now given the task of carrying a cross. Now, an adult male in his early 30s, given the task of carrying this cross, is going to be difficult for anyone, but you would imagine uh, somebody who is as fit and physically uh, in such a good shape as our Lord was, that he would be able to do it without any issue. However, we notice at this point that he is struggling, struggling heavily to carry this cross to the point where we notice that he falls. And we, are, uh, we note that he falls at least three times. He's having so much trouble to carry the cross that they even have to bring someone else to help. And why is it that he's having so much trouble carrying this cross at this time, even though he doesn't have any kind of medical condition coming up to this point? It's because he's been dehydrated. He's going on no food, no sleep. He's lost so much blood. And because he's lost so much blood, He's not having enough oxygen go to his muscles. And anytime you're doing any kind of heavy lifting, you need to have lots of oxygen going to those muscles or else what's going to start to happen is the muscles are not going to have enough energy to do the work that is required. And so this is why our Lord falls once, twice, three times as he's carrying the cross several kilometers to get to the destination of Golgotha. When our Lord was asked to carry the cross, if you think about the cross that our Lord Jesus Christ had to bear, it's a 100-pound crossbar. It's not, uh, it's not unexpected that our Lord Jesus Christ was not able to carry this cross. Even a strong weightlifter would have a hard time to carry this cross, but our Lord now, in this very weakened uh, state, uh, clearly would not be able to carry this cross, which is why it's not surprising that as the tradition tells us, the Lord Jesus Christ fell several times carrying the cross, and even he could not carry the, the crossbar to the point that they had to ask help from Simon of Cyrene uh, to help carry uh, the cross. As part of the crucifixion, the prisoner is usually given a combination of myrrh and wine. It's a very old type of anesthetic. It's meant to help the soldiers to really manipulate the prisoner so he does not fight them. More than likely, our Lord was subjected to this twice, one before crucifixion and the second one right before his death when he refused to drink, although he said, I thirst. Some of the soldiers saw how much pain and suffering that he was having as he was on the cross, that they offer him a sponge. And on the sponge was myrrh and gall. 
It, if you think about these things, it's sort of some kind of rudimentary anesthetic. Uh, and it's something that would uh, maybe help ease the pain to a very slight degree, the best that they can do at the time. And our Lord, when He noticed what it was, refused to have the myrrh. As our Lord Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross, uh, by Roman law, the soldiers there would offer Him wine mixed with gall or myrrh. And this wine mixed with the gall uh, or myrrh is actually a uh, type of a crude anesthetic uh, to help numb the intense pain that our Lord Jesus would be enduring uh, at this point. Um, but interestingly, the Gospels tell us that when he tasted, he refused to drink as our Lord actually desired to endure the pain for our sake, which was the reason that he, uh, he came for this moment. The prisoner is lifted up on the stipes using ropes. Sometimes the shoulder gets dislocated because they have to pull to put his arms into the places of the nails. How do they fix the arms on the cross? They bring the hand and the nail and they usually go through the area of the wrist, not the palm. The reason they cannot go through the palm because if the prisoner pulls, it will actually damage the tissues and the prisoner may fall. But by putting the nail into the area of this wrist, there are several smaller bones. Strangely, when experiments were done on corpuses, when they try to push a nail through, it does not damage or break a bone, but rather go through this area and it looks like this. So it's actually hanging the hand without the person ever falling. Dr. Edwards, William Edwards from Mayo Clinic has a great paper, 1986, a famous paper uh, about uh, how physical death of Jesus. Uh, a group of physicians from Italy actually uh, started to do the experiment like here. They started to uh, nail this cadaver and x-ray it to see if any bone will be uh, cracked or fractured and if it's really will sustain the body into whatever anchor to. And they found out it is possible that a nail with these dimensions comes through the, this four carpal tunnel uh, bones and will really anchor the body and the hand to whatever surface uh, you, um, it goes through. If I can show in my own hand, this is called the radial nerve and the ulnar nerve. And because of the nail coming in this area, it will come very close and can cause severe pain and contracture of the hand. Because he was nailed here in the wrist, there is a nerve here called the median nerve. And this nerve can cause, if it's injured, can cause uh, paralysis or weakness uh, or pain in the, uh, this part of the, of the hand. So th these nerves, one of them called the median nerve, which is coming in the middle, and the other one is the ulnar nerve, uh, which comes inside. And as we see here, it, it forms like a tunnel. Anything go between these two nerves will be rubbing through the nerve and fraction with it, uh, do a fraction force with it, will be eliciting a fiery pain. These nerves is not only for the sensation of our hand, but also for the micro-movement of our hand. So um, here, beside the nail spot, uh, a vessel called ulnar artery. The ulnar artery is one of the arteries that the physician can see the pulse from. Uh, in order to see how the nail goes through these arteries and, and the nerves, see, so the nail goes through this space without fracturing any bone and will injure the ulnar artery, ulnar nerve, and median nerve. The reality is, is, as these nails are going into the hands, uh, it's cutting right into the median nerve, and this can easily lead to a very painful uh, stimulus that can even lead to a pain shock. Shock because of 
hypovolemia, but also shock because of the pain, the amount of pain that he is having, which reverberates throughout his entire body. And so uh, throughout his entire body, he's having all this and this all uh, c culminating into this pain shock that he might be having. As far as the feet, more than likely, the two feet of our Lord were placed on top of each other and one nail went between the second and the third metatarsal bone. And as you can imagine, he is not pulling, but rather pushing. There will be no rupture of any of these tissues. Unfortunately, the placement of these nails on the feet or the hand are not done in a surgical way. So it will cause severe pain, lots of bleeding, and when a person tries to pull and push in and out to breathe, the nail comes in friction with the nerve and excruciating pain occurs, sending fiery bolts along the hand. Dr. William Edwards uh, illustrate how uh, the nail goes through the feet, but in this time, the nail goes through the feet, the second and third metatarsal bone, the same group of physicians in Italy uh, do uh, like a comparison between the coffin and the nail spot and it comes through that the nail goes through the second and the third metatarsal bone uh, using the imprint from the coffin. Those soldiers are trained to make the prisoners have sort of a 90 degrees angle on their knees so they are not straight. The reason for that, they push down against the nail on the feet and they pull up with their hands. And that allows them to breathe in. And when they relax their hands and they bend their knees, they exhale. So inhalation through pulling on the nails of the hands and pushing against the nail on the foot, while exhalation will be relaxing the hands and bending the knees. On top of that, we realize that essential to the body's function is having the ability to oxygenate. Our Lord has already lost at this point so much blood volume, so much hemoglobin that carries oxygen throughout his body. But not just has he lost so much oxygen, but he's also losing the ability to use the muscles that he has in his body uh, because uh, of the lack of oxygen that's being transported across and also because he's unable to take as deep a breath as he should take. The concept that many of us have is that it is a diaphragm that moves our lungs open. However, it's not just a diaphragm that moves our lungs open, but we have so many accessory muscles in our rib cage. And as we take those deep breaths, uh, we use not just the diaphragm, but all these extra muscles in our ribcage. Our Lord was not able to use all those extra muscles. Uh, a, a very good example is if somebody is very tired and exhausted and is trying to take a deep breath after maybe running for some time, they would put their hand on a table and take a deep breath like that. And being able to push down like that helps open up the ribcage and helps pr uh, people to breathe a little bit better because it's all the extra muscles that now they can use. But our Lord did not have that option because His hands were up and His feet were tied. And in order to breathe, He had to push up and His back would rub up against the cross. And let me tell you, that in and of itself can cause lots of pain. But again, we're talking about somebody who's having so much trouble breathing that the amount of oxygen rem uh, circulating throughout His body is not adequate. And as the oxygen is not going to the muscles and he's using all these muscles to try to breathe as much as he can, you have a buildup of lactic acid in the muscles. And as you have a buildup of acid in the body, you start to go into hypovolemic shock. And on top of that, you have acidotic shock on top of the fact that he might have neurogenic shock because of all the pain that he is uh, undergoing. The breathing of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross is also a major factor likely contributing to uh, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we take a deep breath, the diaphragm moves down and this creates a negative pressure in the chest and we're able to take a deep breath 
in. When we breathe out or exhale, that's usually passive, where the diaphragm goes back up, and that creates a positive pressure in the chest and allows the air to come back out. There are certain people who have a condition called COPD, which is the closest way I can explain how the breathing of our Lord Jesus Christ was affected on the cross. And these patients have a condition where their lungs are very hyperinflated. Usually COPD we see in someone who smoked, for example, many years, and they develop chronic damage to uh, their lungs. They become so hyperinflated that they require to lean on something in order to take a deep breath, and they're usually in this position leaning forward um, in order to be able to breathe. So if you imagine our Lord Jesus Christ as his arms are outstretched on the cross and um, his feet are uh, nailed also, he's not able to lean on the ground, he's not able to uh, position himself in a way to take a deep breath or to be able to breathe out appropriately. He is very, his, his diaphragm is likely uh, by gravity come down and he's maybe able to breathe in but he has a very hard time breathing out, especially as his arms are outstretched. He cannot uh, fl flex his elbows. He cannot bring his shoulders down so he can be able to breathe out as we would normally require in order to exhale normally. And so you can imagine that as this happens for a long time, every time that our Lord needs to breathe in and out, he has to press on his feet. And this, of course, is going to be rubbing his back that has been scourged along the back of the, along the, the vertical beam of the cross causing more pain and he has to use a lot of muscles. You have to realize his muscles are also weakened because they were scourged. Uh, his muscles are weakened because he has decreased blood volume. His muscles are weakened because uh, if you think about the scourging, one of the things that can happen is that as they're scourging from behind, they're likely affecting the muscles of respiration. If you think about the rib spaces, there are, on the, um, between the rib spaces, there are two layers of muscles. There's the external intercostal muscles, which help with, can assist uh, with uh, inhalation. And then on the inside, there is the internal intercostal muscles, which can help with exhalation. It is very likely that these muscles during the scourging were affected. Uh, it is also possible that during the scourging of our Lord Jesus Christ, that if you imagine, we talked about the sharp uh, animal bones that are on the, the whips, that they may have penetrated, if you think about the intercostal space, that, the, that they can penetrate through that space, and if they go through that space, they can hit the lungs and cause what's called a pneumothorax, or a collapsed lung, which would also make it very hard for our Lord Jesus Christ to breathe. Um, so, of course, the breathing of our Lord Jesus Christ on the, on the cross was likely, was of course very affected um, and um, likely contributed to, uh, to his passing away. This, you may now imagine why they break the legs for them to die. As we read in the Gospel of John, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross of the Sabbath, for that Sabbath, was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. I would like now to describe a phenomenon called cruci fracture. I just explained to you that the prisoner, for him to breathe, they push against the nail on the feet and pull with the nail on the hands. How do they kill them? They break the tibia, which is the bone of the leg. They cannot breathe after that, because once they break the legs, they cannot push, and eventually they take one or two breaths, they die of suffocation, called cruci fracture. This did not happen to our Lord Jesus Christ, who was already dead before they broke his legs to have the prophecy fulfilled that none of his bones was broken. Are the three that were crucified, are they all dead? Because at that time they wanted to bring the bodies down because it was becoming the Sabbath. And so the two who were crucified with him were not yet dead. They had to break their legs in order to speed up their death. 
If you think about it from a critical care perspective, at this point in time, what is happening to our Lord Jesus Christ from a, a medical standpoint? Uh, well, you have to expect that the only way that the Lord is able to function at this point is from his adrenaline surge, or what we call the fight or flight uh, response. What are the theories explaining the causes of death of our Lord? As I said initially, our Lord was in a good health. Yes, he was subjected to physical torture, sleep deprivation, lack of water, and eventually suffering. Many of the scientists all over the last 50 years have written some theories. And you can see many of their theories may or may not make sense. Suffocation was not proven to be a true cause of death, simply because our Lord did not have his legs broken. And almost every scholar disagreed that suffocation was a reason for our Lord's medical reason for death. We have somebody who is already in a state of hypovolemia or low volume uh, and almost to the point of where he is in uh, what we would call hypovolemic shock where his blood pressure is not going to be able to maintain a good circulation of the blood throughout the body. The question is what ultimately led to uh, the death of our Lord on the cross and I truly believe it is multifactorial. Um, uh, one, we talked about uh, hypovolemia from the dehydration uh, and, and also the blood loss, what's called hemorrhagic shock, likely contributed to the death of our Lord. The second and most important cause of death is hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemia means decreased volume of the blood. Our Lord was subjected to dehydration from 6 p.m. on Thursday night till 3 p.m. on Friday no drinking. Clearly he said, I thirst. He was sweating in Gethsemane. It was read that he was dropping sweat and blood. In Caiaphas' house, overnight, he was not offered a drink. His blood loss was due to many reasons. The hematohydrosis, the flogging for 39 times, hitting on the head, the nails, the thorns, and the reopening of his back wounds when they put and then take out and replace the scarlet garment. In the medical literature, there are five stages of thirst. Dry mouth and mucous membranes craving liquid. Saliva and throat are thick and sticky, and the tongue sticks and they are craving water above all else. The third stage is stiffening of the eyelids. The fourth, the tip of the tongue is hardened. The fourth, visions of streams and pools of water. If a patient like our Lord Jesus Christ at this point were to come to the emergency room, he would clearly need to be in the intensive care unit. Likely his blood pressure is uh, very low. Um, uh, the sympathetic nervous system is trying to kick in to help out and the adrenaline surge, but likely his blood pressure is very low. He has lost a significant amount of blood volume in addition to all the dehydration. Um, his heart is probably very weakened uh, at this point. Likely he's starting to develop multiple organ injury or, you know, for example, the kidneys are probably because the, the volume in the blood is significantly diminished. The kidneys have developed injury. The liver may be developing injury. If I would check blood levels on our Lord Jesus Christ, likely his hemoglobin, which is uh, the amount of blood in the body, is very low from the bleeding. Uh, likely, at this point, if I look for um, uh, a, a measure called lactate, a marker called lactate, which is a marker of how much blood flow to the tissues. Uh, for certain, we would need to give them medications to tolerate the pain. That's number one. Number two, we would want to make sure that we would uh, breathe, that would, we would be breathing for them and oxygenating for them because they no longer would be able to oxygenate their own body. Number three, we would need to make sure that they have now repl replenished all the blood that they may have lost 
because of all these events that have happened where he uh, would have lost so much blood. And so uh, we see the reasons of why he might have died on the cross through all this, because he lost a lot of blood, because he's not able to oxygenate uh, the blood in his body and to give oxygen to the tissues. Hypovolemic shock sounds one of the most acceptable ways that our Lord had died from, especially that it fits the biblical accounts. In Psalm 22, I am poured out like water and my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Clearly, signs of dehydration and melting of the heart. In Matthew 27, when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own cloth on him, and led him away to be crucified. By taking and replacing and taking out the robe, they are reopening the wounds of the flogging. Psalm 69, they also gave me gal for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And in Psalm 22, my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. And in Luke 22, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. These accounts clearly show hypovolemia. Another plausible method of dying is a psychological shock. In the Gospel of St. Luke, it says that the agony of our Lord was so severe that his sweat became like great drops of blood. And you have to understand the intense emotional burden that Jesus was going through as he was sorrowful and deeply distressed even uh, telling his disciples that his soul is deeply sorrowful, even unto death. Uh, and then the agony in the garden causing him to sweat with the intense agony resulting in our Lord sweating blood. Jesus was a very sensitive man. He even cried when Lazarus died. He was certainly in mental agony in Gethsemane, and his sweat was bloody. All of these can cause vasodilatation, of the capillaries under the skin, causing drop in blood pressure. Psychological shock can be also seen in biblical accounts. In Psalm 69, reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. Psalm 22. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. Zechariah 13. I was wounded in the house of my friends. Isaiah 53. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Same chapter. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many. Luke 22. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The third possible method by which our Lord died some scholars called it septic shock. Another type of shock is called distributive shock, which the most common cause of distributive shock is infection, or what we refer to as septic shock. And we talked about how our Lord may have developed an infection from the crown of thorns, uh, causing an opening in, um, in the skin for which an infection can occur, or from the scourging where the skin was ripped open, or from um, uh, from the nails in the side of our, in the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, in the leg. This can all cause an infection or can even cause what's called a toxogenic shock or anaphylactic shock. The word septicemia 
means severe infection reaching the blood. Tetanus is a very virulent infection, usually transmitted via the spores of horses' feces. The nails are probably found in the animal stables, and more than likely they don't clean it before they put it in the hand of the prisoner, causing severe muscle spasms, spasmodic contractions, to the extent some people can have fractures of their bones because the muscles are really pulling so much. Sometimes it causes respiratory failure because the diaphragmatic muscle becomes spasmodic and does not move. More than likely this is, didn't happen to our Lord only because it will take 12 hours to 36 hours for that titanospasmine to reach the blood. However, there are some biblical accounts that can also speak about septicemia. We read in Isaiah 1, From the sole of the foot even to the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. In Isaiah 53, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. Another hypothesis for our Lord's death is neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is usually due to severe pain, severe agony. Painful stimuli that have been so strong, and now we have uh, someone who is having nails being put into their hands and to their legs, and though all of these uh, syndromes together uh, is causing him to have such decreased blood flow throughout his body that will ultimately lead to his death on the cross. Uh, another thing that can occur here is what's called neurogenic shock and this can occur from intense pain. It can, if, you, uh, if you imagine somebody who's intense pain, sometimes they may pass out from that pain because the blood pressure can drop very low. This is called neurogenic shock. This likely also contributed to uh, the low blood pressure and the shock state of our Lord. From a biblical account, neurogenic shock can be seen. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. Psalm 21. In Isaiah 53, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. In Matthew 27, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Called stress-induced cardiomyopathy, or Takotsubo's cardiomyopathy, which is a weakening of the heart muscle that occurs with any intense stress or any intense uh, emotional burden or any physical pain that someone may endure can actually cause, uh, stun the heart and make it less able to pump. So not only did the Lord lose a lot of the blood volume, but also the heart is weak. So if the heart cannot pump that blood uh, and there's not that much blood to pump, you can imagine how low the blood pressure went. Uh, so not only was he in a hypovolemic shock, in a hemorrhagic shock, in a possible cardiogenic shock, what therapies would we give our Lord Jesus Christ at this point to help him recover from the severe torture and suffering that he is going through? Well, first of all, he clearly needs intravenous fluids. He, he is so dehydrated, deconditioned, not eating or drinking for an extended period of time, he needs fluids to resuscitate his blood volume. Secondly, because of all the blood that he has lost, he will need blood products, especially packed red blood cells to replace the blood that he has lost. But he may even need uh, blood products such as uh, platelets and plasma to help him stop the bleeding. If you imagine that our Lord Jesus Christ may have lost a liter of blood or two liters of blood, this can be up to 40 to 50 percent of his normal blood volume. If, if all of us have in, in our hearts right now, our hearts pump out about five liters of blood per minute. So if the Lord has lost one liter or two liters, that can be up to 
up to 40% of his blood volume and he's not getting this replaced as he hangs on the cross and continues in his suffering. Um, what other medications would we give to our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, clearly he needs pain medications, but as we discussed, he refused the, the wine mixed with gall or myrrh to numb his pain. What other medications would we give him? Um, he would likely, because his blood pressure is so low, he would need medications to help raise his blood pressure. Medications such as norepinephrine or phenylephrine or dopamine or even epinephrine to help uh, maintain his blood pressure from all uh, the blood volume, the dehydration, and the shock that he is enduring. Uh, he would likely require antibiotics from all the openings in his skin, from the crown of thorns, from the scourging in the back, uh, and the buttocks and the legs, and from the nails. Uh, likely he developed an infection and would, would require uh, antibiotics to help uh, fight this infection, uh, which contributed to the death. And lastly, uh, the breathing, uh, inability to, to breathe well on the cross, would lead to the carbon dioxide level rising very high, the oxygen level dropping, and this would eventually lead to our Lord uh, passing. Quoting the Journal of American Medical Association, the major pathophysiologic effect of crucifixion was an interference with normal respirations. Accordingly, death resulted primarily from hypovolemic shock and exhaustion asphyxia. Jesus' death was ensured by the thrust of a soldier's spear into his side. Modern medical interpretation of the historical evidence indicate that Jesus was dead when taken down from the cross. Dr. William uh, Edwards has this paper and he illustrated how the lancet thrust through uh, Jesus' side. And as you can see here, it goes through the skin first, then uh, in between the ribs, and then a cavity between the ribs and the lung, and then the lung, and then going through the cavity between the lung and the heart, and into the right ventricle or the heart. What is the reason for this uh, blood and water, maybe medically speaking, is a different story. Uh, there are some hypotheses that we can say. Uh, this could be a result of a uh, buildup of fluids around the lungs, and as somebody were to push a spear into and essentially you could think of the lungs like balloons and when a balloon is popped and they push the spear through and out comes uh, this the, the balloon is popped and pushes out whatever is around it and this water what might have been the fluid that was around the lungs because he wasn't able to take such good breaths while he was on the cross uh, also another theory is that it could be a buildup of fluid around the heart itself uh, it's uncertain exactly what is the cause of the blood and the water, but the reality is, is that when, we, when the soldiers saw that, they realized that Christ had, at that point, already died. Uh, in order to understand how the, we see blood and water coming out of Jesus, or the person who was describing this, see blood and water, we illustrated, we will illustrate how much fluid in the lung and what is can happen when you thrust. Here is a black arrow like a lancet going through the lung and from the lung into the pericardium and from the pericardium into the heart. I would like to quote Saint Augustine. Adam foreshadowed Christ and as Adam was a type of Christ, so too was the creation of Eve from the sleeping Adam, a prefiguration of the creation of the church from the side of the Lord as he slept. For, as he suffered and died on the cross and was struck by a lance, the sacraments which formed the church flowed forth from him. By Christ's sleeping, we also are to understand his passion. As Eve came from the side of the sleeping Adam, so the church was born from the side of the suffering Christ. In other words, our Lord was the second Adam. The first Adam slept in paradise, and Eve came from his side. And the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, slept on the cross, and the church, his bride, came, depicted by the two sacraments, the water as baptism, 
and the blood as communion. The blood and water continues to be a mystery, but it's not a mystery for the theologians. He is trying to give us life through his death, even if we cannot explain it well by medicine. And so he was clearly able to experience the intense suffering and the mountain of tortures that he was uh, subjected to. And it's important to understand that though we can speculate regarding the medical cause of his death, our medical explanation will be limited because after all, we're trying to describe the death of God incarnate. As we read from the first book of John, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Jesus had full control over his own death. He answered Pilate by saying, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He bowed his head before he died, in contrast to normal death where the reverse occurs. I don't know if we can attribute it to one cause, but likely all these together contributed to the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, an intense amount of suffering and pain and torture that our Lord endured for us all. Uh, when you consider the medical perspective of how our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, it is truly overwhelming the love that our Lord had uh, for us. And so our Lord had already suffered death on the cross for our sake in such a short time because of all the pain and suffering that led up to that point. And so uh, we see how much our Lord went through in His death and suffering and crucifixion on the cross. So to conclude, the cross was a method to die, but not a reason to die. Our Lord mentioned that I have authority to put it down and to take it. He also answered Pilate, you have no authority over me. He also said in John 10, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Saint Gregory of Nicaea wrote, For his divinity before his incarnation, after his incarnation, and after his sufferings, is not subject to change. He is, as always, the same at all times, with the same nature. He will remain as He is forever when He became incarnated. The Almighty completed the plan for our benefit. He temporarily separated the soul from the body. However, this occurred without the separation of the divine from either of them, both soul and body which were once united, were reunited through him once more. Hence, he grants all humanity a new beginning and an example of what will occur in the resurrection of the dead. St. John Chrysostom wrote, As they often sought to kill him, he told them, Unless I want that to happen, you will work in vain. Through the first preposition, he gives proof to the second. Through his death, he gives proof to the resurrection. This is what makes it all strange and amazing. Indeed, he is the sole one with the power to lay down his life. He revealed that he possesses that same authority to take it up again. In summary, we attempted at explaining the reasons and the ways of our Lord's sufferings and death. By no means we can explain except one thing. If he did not want to be dead, no one could have killed him. Accept these theories as theories, but learn more that his divinity never departed from his humanity, even 
for a twinkle of an eye. Thank you.